my basketball coach was mad at me. I was a decent athlete, a, a little above average when compared to, you know, the world. But I was never in any way elite. And as luck would have it, my favorite sport that I could play in high school, we didn't have a lot of team sports, was the one I was probably the worst at, basketball. Short, small hands, not a great shooter. Well, I was actually a really good defender, but despite the fact that coaches talk a good game about how defense is what wins, it's the guy who can put it in the hole who gets to play. And in 10th grade, I discovered something, theater acting, especially comic acting. And I realized that if I was going to keep my grades up, I couldn't keep doing both sports and the arts. And so when the varsity coach paid us JVs a visit late in the season to take an informal poll on whether or not we were all coming back next season, I told the truth. I said, I don't think so. What I meant, and what everyone on my team knew I meant, was maybe it was time to start doing something I was actually good at. But Coach wasn't happy. Mind you, he's the same coach who, at the end of the year, would put his arm around me and say, Mike, I'm really proud of you. You just don't got it. You just don't. But you work harder than anyone else, and you never let it get in your way. <laughs> but those awkward words of praise were still a few weeks away, a few weeks away, and right now he was mad. We were doing layup drills. You know, two lines facing the basket, everybody in one line takes a layup, the guys in the other line get the rebound and pass to the next shooter. And coach was standing under the basket, and he was riding me. Martine, left hand. Use the left hand. Do you do theater with just the right hand? Martine, Martine! Footwork. When you play music, Martine, are your feet all out of place? You get it. It didn't matter if I was making the shot or not. He was mad. Where I grew up, sports were everything. And being good enough to be on the team, that was an honor. And I was walking away to be part of something else, leaving the group, going to another group that was considered decidedly less cool. And Coach took it personally. How could I leave his group? I was failing, probably, in his eyes, to appreciate the work he'd put into me, my position, and the fact that there were quite a few guys who would have been very happy to ride the pine just to be able to say they were on the team. I totally got it. I was breaking the code, leaving the boys in favor of going to a place where, yes, even the guys wore makeup. Luke, the gospel writer, loves to take stories of Jesus that are alike and put them together. This is likely his greatest example of this. He takes three classic parables of Jesus, including the one for which he is arguably most famous, Good Samaritan aside, and clumps them together. But the part of Luke's artistry that's really impressive is how he creates an audience to hear the parables. Two groups. The not-so-cool group and the cool. The lost and the found as separate as the jocks and the nerds in the old movies. Luke writes, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So over here you've got the earthy crowd and they're the tax collectors who are highly frowned upon, and the sinners, fallen folk who probably barely practice their faith, if at all. And over here, you got the Pharisees. Now, 
it's pretty much Christian standard practice to drag these guys through the dirt. But in reality, they were trying. They were good. They wanted to be better. And they were more like Jesus than any other Jewish sect. But while in many ways they were the found, they're obviously not cool with whom Jesus has decided to hang with. Maybe you've heard me say this a hundred times. In the day of Jesus, you were who you ate with. So it's already not cool that Jesus is breaking the rules and associating with those people over there. He's eating with them. And that signifies solidarity, even intimacy. And the Pharisees complain because he should be hanging with them. And Jesus hears the complaints and indicative of his genius, he tells three stories of things that are lost. A coin, a sheep, and a son. And what is remarkable about each tale is that the worth of the lost item seems so obvious. Of course a woman would search for her lost coin of silver. Of course she would light a lamp and sweep in, the effort, in that effort to find it. Of course a shepherd would leave his sheep to find the one who was lost. Of course he would tear about, retrace the movements of the flocks, use his knowledge of what sheep do, what they like, to figure out where that little guy had gone. And of course, though this one sparks more argument, a father would welcome home his wayward child because that's what parents do. The Pharisees are angry. How dare Jesus break the rules, go to another group? How dare he sully himself? What they weren't seeing is this. In the eyes of God, those lost, they were worth just as much as those who had already been found. And that is what, upon hearing these stories, the Pharisees have to swallow. Of course, that last story, the one most of us call the prodigal son, was the hardest to swallow. You can't blame a coin for landing on its side and rolling away. You can't blame a sheep for doing what sheep do. But that younger son, mm, that's another matter. He had been irresponsible, a pleasure seeker, with no regard for the beautiful life his father had given him. He just wanted more, he wanted his, and he wanted it now. And make no mistake, all of those things lost in the stories that Jesus told, they were the undesirables, the people Jesus was hanging with. And that son, you know, the older son, the dutiful, faithful son who toiled day in and day out for his father in that story? He was the Pharisees. And the plea the father makes in the story, the plea to his faithful son to rejoice, join the party, and recognize that his brother, who had been lost, has been found? Those words, at least in Luke, are directed right at the Pharisees. It's like God saying, I understand why you think those folks have given up their worth in my eyes, but you have to understand that their worth is not theirs to give. I will love them always as I love you, as I love you, even when you fail. The worth, the worth of a person in the eyes of God does not vanish when they become lost. Whether they become lost because of things beyond their control or because of their own mistakes, 
their worth in God's eyes, our worth in God's eyes, is not ours to give. God still loves and longs to welcome the fallen home. That's the comforting part of the message. The challenging part? God calls us to do likewise. To reach out beyond our own group, beyond those we are comfortable with, beyond those we fit in with and understand, beyond those who we feel are perhaps more deserving. God calls us to reach out and serve. We live in a world where separation between people often seems to be growing. The separation between rich and poor, the separation caused by political ideologies, separation caused by racial tensions, separation caused by perceived differences in values. But the Je genius of Jesus is in this call. Those you call lost, God values beyond measure and calls you to do the same. We are called to be light in this world. And the only way to do that is to, leave, to, is to live each day actively seeking to love others, actively seeking to help others, actively seeking to welcome even those we disagree with, who bug us, who don't seem to deserve a second chance. Yes, there's a time for tough love, and we're not called to be everyone's best friend. But not to love is never an option. My guess is something will happen to each one of us this week, that we will have an opportunity to demonstrate God's love. Maybe even for someone who is not, well, like us, to someone from the other side of the big cafeteria of life, from that group. The plea of Jesus is to do this, show that love. Even if the one who needs it seems lost, especially if they're lost. It might help that person to be found. And there will be rejoicing in heaven and hopefully in your heart.